Good evening and uh, welcome to our last Robertson School Speaker Series event uh, during this spring semester. We're excited to welcome Ken Marcus of the Martin Agency for his talk titled Developing a Creative Mindset. Uh, my name is Marcus Messner. I'm the director of the Robertson School of Media and Culture and the Associate Dean of the College of Humanities and Sciences here at VCU. Uh, during our event, uh, our audience members can post questions here in the webinar on our live stream on Facebook and uh, via Twitter with the hashtag VCU Robertson. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Scott Sherman, uh, who is an associate professor in our advertising sequence and our advertising sequence coordinator. Uh, I hope all of you will have a great evening with the Robertson School Speaker Series. Scott? Uh, well, I'll try to be brief. There's a lot to say about uh, Ken, and uh, but uh, because I, I want to be brief because I know you want you're here to hear him and 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 how to develop a creative mindset. Uh, Ken graduated from JMU. Um, he uh, went to work at uh, Arnold Agency for five years, and then went over to uh, Martin Agency, which is Adweek's Agency of the Year. Very big uh, title to get. And uh, speaking of awards, Ken has won virtually all the big awards in the ad business. Uh, one show, Can, uh, Communication Arts, Effies, and he's listed on Adweek's uh, Creative 100. And unless you've lived under a rock or something like that, you've seen Ken's work. Um, I show a lot of his work in my classes to show what good advertising campaigns look like. And uh, pretty much every Wednesday, I might quote some of his work with hump day. Um, Ken teaches at the VCU Brand Center. And if that wasn't enough, he's a creator of a uh, Now Upon a Time project is a storytelling project that reimagines classical tales um, with more empowering, empowering messages, with strong female characters, modern relationships. Check out uh, his Little Mermaid uh, version. It's pretty nice. Ken's a very nice guy. He's visited classes uh, with us a lot of times, and he comes to our portfolio show at the end of the semester, gives a lot of good feedback. I think I've said enough. Take it away, Ken. Thanks for being here. Cool. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to do my little screen share here with an optimized video clip. Okay. Cool. And you all should see my uh, big slide there. Cool. Uh, again, thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Um, uh, like Scott said, I'm at Martin ANC. I've been there about 14 years. I still feel like I'm new, but I'm not. And uh, I've been in business about a little over 20 years. And uh, yep, I've been a senior writer pretty much the whole time. And I teach writers uh, as an adjunct at Brand Center. So uh, definitely advertising and writing is my focus. I hope this um, lecture could be geared towards all general people thinking about mass communication and advertising and marketing and design and UX production, just general creative career. I think uh, even though, you know, obviously I'll have an emphasis on advertising, I think no matter what you go into, you'll be able to take something from this lecture. So uh, I'm about to show my reel. It's about five minutes long. It's just uh, some ads I've done four or five minutes, and then we'll get into my lecture. But yeah, I've, I work primarily on Geico the last five, six years. So very broadcast heavy, very television heavy, TV, uh, radio heavy. Um, there's some sling on here, which was a recent, which was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, a lot of Geico work is sort of what I've been up to the last five, six years. Well, the squirrels are back in the attic. Mom? Your dad won't call an exterminator. Can I call you back, Mom? He says it's personal this time. If you're a mom, you call at the worst time. It's what you do. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to GEICO. It's what you do. Where are you? It's very loud there. Are you taking a Zumba class? I want it. I can't believe it. That car brought his karaoke machine. No, I can't believe how easy it was to save hundreds of dollars on my car insurance with Geico. Go, Kevin! Go, Kevin! No! 
Uh, Believe it. Geico could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Wondering how Mommy and Daddy keep it fresh? We're slingers. You heard that right, boss. We sling. Hey, kids. Want to sling with us? The freedom <laughs> is exhilarating. Woo! Nick, Megan. Oh, hey, Greg. We talked about this, right? I remember. Okay, thank you. Methinks the Mater D doth protest too much. <laughs> Folks, we've got a big couch that will fit all four of us. We could beanbag it if that's more your jazz. Sorry, guys. Want to start slinging? Millions are doing it. Sling TV is the live TV you love, only better, and only $25 a month. With Sling, it's easy to watch your favorite live TV, like college football, without the long-term contracts. So start slinging the live TV you love for $25 a month. They ended up coming over for some pretty intense slinging. They always do. <laughs> To watch America's number one live TV streaming service for seven days free, go to SlingTV.com. Uh-oh. Guess what day it is. Guess what day it is. Huh? Anybody? Julie, hey, guess what day it is. Oh, come on. I know you can hear me. Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? <laughs> Leslie, guess what today is. It's hump day. Woo-woo! Ronnie, how happy are folks who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico? I'd say happier than a camel on Wednesday. Hump day! Get happy. Yeah. Get Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. 130 yards now. Bill's got a very tough lie here. Looks like we have some sort of sea monster in the water hazard here. I believe that's a Kraken, Bruce. It looks like he's going to go with the 9-iron. That may not be enough club. Well, he's definitely going to lose his stroke on this hole. If you're a golf commentator, you whisper. It's what you do. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to GEICO. It's what you do. This golf course is elite. We love our new home. There's so much space. We have a guest room now. But we have ants. You're slouching again, Ted. Expired. 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 Thanks, Aunt Bonnie. It's a lot of house. I hope you can keep it clean. At least GEICO makes bundling our home and car insurance easy. Which helps us save a lot of money. Oh, Teddy, did you get my friend request? Oh, I'll have to check. Aunt Joni's here! For bundling made easy, go to GEICO.com. Hello! We like to let folks know we're DTS. Down to slang. Hey, Cynthia! You and Bruce want to sling tonight? Um, no, we just... No, Sounds good. Bruce, bring your... Mom! Be there! We're gonna go all night! Yeah! We're slingers and proud of it. Deal with it, nerds. Sling TV is the live TV you love with no long-term contracts. Stop paying too much for TV. Watch seven days free at slingtv.com. Devin, did you know GEICO is now offering an extra 15% credit on car and motorcycle policies? Okay. That's 15% on top of what GEICO could already save you. So what are you waiting for? DJ Khaled to be your motivational coach? <laughs> Yo, Devin, remember the brush in a circle motion. Thank you, DJ Khaled. Tiny circles, Devin. Do another one. Another one. Is this good? Put in that word, Devin. Don't give up. Geico. Save an extra 15% when you switch by October 7th. Let's hide in the attic. No, in the basement. Why can't we just get in the running car? Are you crazy? Let's hide behind the chainsaws. Smart. <laughs> yeah, okay. If you're in a horror movie, you make poor decisions. That's what you do. Shh, I'm being quiet. Breathing on me. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to Geico. It's what you do. Yeah, I just saved a whole lot of money by switching to Geico. Huh. We should take a closer look at Geico. You know, GEICO insures way more than cars, boats, motorcycles, even RVs. GEICO insures RVs? What's an RV? Uh, the thing we've been stuck on for five years. Wait, I'm not a real moose? We've been over this, Jeff. We're stickers. I'm not a real moose. Give him some space. Deep breaths, Jeff. What's a sticker? Take a closer look at GEICO. Great savings and a whole lot more. Marco, pull up. 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 See? <laughs> Playing Marco Polo with Marco Polo? Surprising. Marco Polo. 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 Marco
Sí, son los queens. What's not surprising? How much money Amanda and Keith saved by switching to Geico. Ah, Polo. Polo. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Polo. You're right. That's the fifth floor problem. Okay. Not in my house. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Not today. <laughs> Jimmy, how happy are folks who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico? Happier than Dikembe Mutombo blocking a shot. <laughs> Get happy. Get Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Cool. So um, let's give you a rough range of work I've done uh, the last uh, five or six years. Obviously, very Geico heavy. Um, even though I'm a writer, I'll point out, you know, this is a team effort. It's a collaborative effort. Um, you know, I have a, a longstanding uh, partner, Sean Riley, a lot of great creative directors, clients lovely, um, a lot of great directors and talent. So these things really are a collaborative team effort. So, but super fun. I consider myself really grateful and lucky to work on that account. They do still buy a lot of good work. They're really smart people. They value humor and simplicity. So um, I consider myself very lucky to work on that account. So anyway, all right, you're freaking out. You can see this. So uh, really we're gonna start transitioning just general career advice. So uh, here we go. Um, so you're freaking out right now. Did I choose the right major? Should I get an internship? Should I go to grad school? What could I possibly do for a career? What will people actually pay me for? What would I get a paycheck for? When all I like to do is make weird movies or TikToks or songs or stories or art or weird comics because you're creative people. But uh, you don't want to have to move back in with your parents, I'm guessing. So I remember when I was in your place, everything seemed super, super critical. Everything's really important. Every decision, every choice, uh, you know, was pivotal with super lasting consequences. I would say that's not true, um, by the way. It's, you know, you're just kind of where you are right now. So I wanna tell you all the stuff I wish I was told when I was in your place as a creative person, uh, kind of coming out of college, beginning to think about what am I gonna do for a career? I really can't help you get a job, I'm gonna be straight. Uh, but I think I can help you put some stuff in perspective from 30,000 feet, stuff looking at the long arc of your career that if you know now, you'll be better off. So I definitely wanna shift your mindset, uh, kind of rewire your thinking to improve your chances to ultimately do what you want in the industry you want, doing the kind of job you want. Um, I think I can improve your chances like 500%. I'm making that statistic up. Today, you'll hear a lot of made up statistics, but I think I'll improve your chances 500%. So anyway, uh, it's perfectly normal to be freaking out. You should be freaking out. You are going to fail. That's right. Thanks for that little pick me up, Ken. Yep, you're gonna fail. Uh, better to get that out of the way now, know that now. Uh, things are not going to work out sometimes, probably many times. You're not going to get the job you want. You're not going to get the internship you want. You're not going to get an interview. Uh, recruiters are going to ghost you left and right. You're not going to get an offer. Your friends are going to get offers. You'll get laid off sometimes. Basically, stuff's not going to work out the way you wanted. This is inevitable. This is having a job. This is being a creative person, particularly in advertising. This is life for you, full stop. Uh, the current job I'm in at Martin, I think I interviewed for three or four times or try to get in the door three or four times. Three times it didn't work out. Uh, only the fourth time it worked out. So yes, you're going to fail. So you have to think about what happens next. And I can say without hyperbole, what happens when stuff doesn't go the way you want, how you behave afterwards, how you talk to yourself, how you think of yourself, uh, your creative self-worth. Um, these are This is an important turning point for when it comes to your career as a creative person, because this is life, like I said, as a creative, putting yourself out there for a job, putting your work on a wall, putting your work on a table, putting it in a deck somewhere and having people judge it and having people kill those ideas, having people turn you down, having people not call you back. This is going to happen time and time again. So how you have to decide how you're going to behave when things simply don't work out, how you behave in the fire. Uh, we're going to let it burn you down. Um, your confidence, how you see yourself as a creative person, or are you going to lose that? Are you going to use that fire as sort of combustion in your engine? Yes, that's a little cheesy. I think I read that on like some weird motivational quote I saw online, but I think it's true. Are you going to use that fire to burn you down, or are you going to use it to fire you, uh, fuel to the fire, and to drive you harder to keep getting better and keep leveling up your skills? So this is your fundamental choice as a creative person. I found that resilience, the ability to power through 
well, when things don't go your way, when things fall apart, is a far better predictor of your success over the long arc of your career, both for your creative work and getting a creative job. Um, I always say uh, talent is overrated. People are like, oh, the person's talented. How talented are they? Talent is overrated. Tenacity far outperforms talent. Perseverance far outweighs talent. A lot of people have talent. Few people have that grit or perseverance to push through when shit doesn't work out. I see some questions. I don't know what to do with that. I'm going to just ignore questions because if I click on it, it's going to go haywire and I'm going to keep going then I'll do questions at the end. Is that cool? Um, so um, I guess I want you all to think about where you are now. Uh, you're in college where things are happen to you. Shit happens to you. I'm going to swear a little bit. I'm sorry. Shit happens to you in school. You have clubs, you have internships, you have speakers like me come to you projects. Everything's laid out to you by your professors. You have so many opportunities uh, presented to you. Whether you take advantage of them or not, that's your decision. But opportunities are served up to you as college students. Once you get that degree, that is over. It is over. Know this. You have to shift your mindset. You have to turn it upside down. This is a massive shift you have to make. From here on out, shit is not going to happen to you. You've got to make shit happen. You've got to send emails. You've got to send IMs on LinkedIn. You've got to um, send invitations. You've got to make calls. You've got to volunteer for clubs. You've got to go to events you don't want to. You've got to meet people. you got to intern. You have to do informational interviews. You have to put yourself out there in front of people. The ball from here on out will be in your court. The bottom line is the more you put yourself out there, go out of your comfort zone, the more you get in front of people doing the kind of thing that you want to do, the luckier you will get more doors will open for you. But you have to make that decision. You can't just be sit back and wait for things to happen. You just can't send a, send a resume or apply for something online and just wait for it to happen. Nope, you gotta put yourself out there. You gotta knock a lot of doors. You gotta poke a lot of boxes. You have to make shit happen. You are what you do. Um, you're not what you wanna be. You're not what you say you wanna be. You are what you do. Like right now, what you make a habit of doing every week. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in charge of looking at all the, we have some like an internship program at Martin. I'm looking at all these applications. Everyone wants to be creative. Everyone wants to be a writer. It's great. But one guy was out there. He was filming his own commercials. Some of them were Geico commercials on the weekend. He was making his own commercials. They were terrible. I didn't want to watch them, but you know, he was doing what he wanted to be. So I said, that nut job is in. So I always value if you want to do something, you should be doing it. You don't need anyone's permission to do what you want to do. So this is your creative practice, whether it's writing or designing or illustrating or coding or making little films, whatever it is, whatever you repeatedly do day in, day out, not what you want to be, but what you do. So hopefully, obviously, as students, you're going to be doing a lot of assignments. But if there's something you are passionate about doing, start doing it. You don't shouldn't have to wait for someone's permission to do it. Um, you should be doing the thing you want to do. So by extension, you are who you say you are. Um, I think this is a huge advantage in how people will perceive you. Don't be like, oh, I want to be a writer. I want to be a designer. I want to be a UX designer or whatever. Say you are one. You don't outsource your identity or who you are to anyone else. You require no one's permission to be what you are. Um, so if you're a writer, if you want to be a writer, you say you're a writer. If you're an illustrator, you're an illustrator. Degree or no degree, job or no job. Um, I think this is a powerful cognitive shift, a powerful difference, not only how someone sees you, but how more importantly, how you see yourself. Uh, I don't think enough people do that. You are who is around you. So when you start to think about your career or starting out, think about the people around you. There's a great quote by this Jim Rohn. He's like some wackadoo motivational speaker it says, you're the average of the five people who you spend time with. So be mindful of who you spend time with, who is around you. Think about who you hang out with, what they're into. Are they into the same cool stuff you're into? Uh, music, comics, fashion, writing, hip hop, design, whatever it is, making films. You want to surround yourself with creative people who are doing the very same thing you want to do. Um, now, you may have your friends that are sitting around all day smoking pot and playing video games. I'm not saying ditch your loser friends, but I'm just saying keep in mind, be mindful of who is around you because I think creative people are like tofu. We basically absorb what's around us. We absorb uh, the flavor that is around us. So be mindful of what is around you. Find your tribe, like find your people that are doing the same stuff that you want to do. Because these are the people that are going to help you 
Uh, these are the people at the end of the day that are going to help you get to where you want to go and who will be with you along the ride. So I think it's really important. You have to be mindful who you spend time with because if those people are not passionate or not into creative things or creative thinking, that's going to rub off on you. So you don't want that. You are who you pretend to be. Um, so, you know, I'm sure you've heard of imposter syndrome as a common feeling among creative people that one day uh, everyone's going to figure me out, that I'm this big fraud, that, um, you know, that I don't belong here. I'm not very good here. All creative people feel this way. You know, you hear it a lot called imposter syndrome. It's pretty common. I submit to you, embrace being the imposter. Uh, you're going to feel like it anyway. So you might as well own it. So what I'm really saying is uh, you might as well pretend you can do more than you can. And I think this is pretty common. Oh, you know, if you're like, oh, we need you to edit this. I'm like, in the back of my head, I'm like, I can't edit. I can't do After Effects. I can't do Final Cut. But you know what? You figure it out. Um, you pretend. You say you can do it. Remember, you are what you do. So um, you are what you say you can do. For me, I'm saying I can talk to a bunch of DCU students in the, in the mass comm program. I'm completely pretending right now. I have no idea what I'm doing. But the point is, I pretend. And if you pretend enough, pretty soon you get to be pretty good until you really aren't pretending anymore. I guess the saying is you fake it till you make it. You just fake it. As a creative person, you fake it until you make it. You don't, if you're going to sit around and wait till you're ready to do something, you'll never do it. You're never going to be fully ready, fully confident to do. You just fake it. Yeah, I can do that. Totally. What do you guys need? You need me to code this? Great. You need me to write that? Great. You need me to illustrate that? Great. I can do it. You know, you need me to do this presentation? Yep, I can do it. You fake it until you make it. Uh, as a quote by author Kurt Vonnegut, we are what we pretend to be. So be careful about what we pretend to be. So be mindful of, you know, you know, people just perceive you by what you put off the energy, the vibe you put off. So be careful about the energy you're putting off. So pretend to do the, pretend to be the right thing. You are a rocket ship. Now I know that sounds super cheesy and that's not really the point. Uh, it's not some dumb motivational line. It sounds like it. No, it's a mindset in that when the Apollo program first went to the moon, they actually didn't have the navigation. They didn't have all the computations in their rudimentary computers. They basically pointed to the moon and said, okay, moon's that way. And they course corrected as they went. They did all these little corrections and adjustments as they went. I think that's how you should approach your creative career. You don't have to be like, I'm totally going to figure out what I want. I, I don't totally know what job I can fill, totally what I'm passionate about. But you, you could say like, okay, the moon is that way. That's where I'm going to go. The most important thing is you just launch in the right general direction. You don't have to have everything figured out. And as you go, you make these little adjustments, these little course corrections, and you're going the right way. So the all thing you need to know is like, what's my general direction? And it may be as broad as something creative, something visual, something with writing, something with design. I want to be in advertising. I want to be in gaming. You just launch. You point and fire. There's a saying, instead of ready, aim, fire, you say fire, ready, aim. Fire, ready, aim. The point is you launch, even if you're not ready. Like you said, if you wait till you're ready, you'll never do it. Then you aim after and you, you figure out when you're ready, whenever that may happen. You just fire, ready, aim. The point is launching is the most important step. You got to give yourself the permission to figure it out as you go. Uh, another dopey way to say it is uh, another science fiction writer, Ray Bradbury, jump off the cliff and build your wings on the way down. You've just got to jump off the cliff. You'll figure it out as you go. Don't stress yourself out that you don't know exactly what you're doing. You'll figure it out. You're not your major. Um, don't stress about your major. Um, there's another made up statistic. I think 90% of people don't ultimately wind up doing what their major is, probably like 80%. I don't know. I'm making statistics up today. Uh, you're not going to wind up necessarily doing exactly what your major is. So do what you're passionate about. Do what you're excited about. Like look into that. The thing you're daydreaming about when you're supposed to be doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. So that's the thing you should probably focus on as a creative person. The thing that you're passionate about. The thing that's kind of in your gut that you won't stop thinking about. Uh, at the end of the day, you got to kind of focus on what your heart's telling you, even if your heart's really stupid. And we all know our hearts are pretty stupid. Uh, but, you know, that doesn't mean do something completely without reason. You know, you can't just turn out and be completely irrational about what you want to do. Uh, you know, you're not going to be Steven Spielberg right out of the gate. You're not going to be a director. But why can't you go into filmmaking? Why can't you be uh, an editor's assistant, a production assistant, a casting assistant, a writer's assistant? Why not? Why can't you just, you know, work in a studio? Why can't you can't? The point is, figure out the moon, what you're interested in, the area of subject, not the title, not the job title right out of the gate. 
then, you know, you want to get yourself around the people that are doing it. You want to put, like I said, put yourself in front of the people that are doing what you want to do, even if it's not the right job title. So again, for example, if you want to be in filmmaking or commercial production, you'd be a PA, PA production assistant. Their jobs suck. Uh, you're getting coffee and running errands and driving people to the airport. But the point is you're surrounding yourself with the people who are doing what you want to do. Directors, DPs, producers, filmmakers, whatever. Um, every producer or director or director of photography has been a PA at some point in their career. So the job title doesn't matter. Surrounding yourself with the people that you can learn from and that they can learn you, that they can get to know you is the important part. So the people around you is what matter. Because honestly, your network, uh, the people that know you and will ultimately vouch for you uh, and say, oh, I know this person, she's great. I know this guy, he's great. You know, th that's your biggest long-term asset. Not your GPA, not what's in your resume, not what's on LinkedIn, but the people that know you and can vouch for you. Uh, so the flip side of that is be cool to everybody. Everyone you meet, everyone you work with, don't be petty, don't talk crap about anyone. You never know when you're gonna be sitting across the desk from that person, all of a sudden they have the decision making whether they can hire you over somebody else or someone's going to ask their opinion oh what about this ken guy is he cool no he's a dick like you don't want that so be kind nice considerate to everyone all creative businesses are much smaller than you think uh don't be an a-hole you'd be surprised how much those little thing trips people up uh eventually um it all comes out in the wash uh so be kind to everyone uh it's a good investment in your long-term network you are uncomfortable. Um, yes, meeting people sucks. If you're like most creative people, if you're like me, I don't like people. I don't like meeting people. I don't like going to professional events and talking to people. Uh, that's out of my comfort zone. And no one likes cold calls. No one likes emailing people they've never met before or you know, sending invitations on LinkedIn. It's uncomfortable. It sucks. No one likes it, particularly creative people. Uh, it's very easy for introverts or creative people to be like, well, I'm just not good at that stuff. I'm not going to do it. I'm shy. I'm an introvert. Guess what? No one likes to do that stuff. No one likes to network. No one likes to put themselves out there uh, and feel vulnerable, uh, especially right brain creative people. You know, so, but the more you do it, the easier it gets. You just got to suck it up and do it anyway. What's the worst that can happen? Someone doesn't get back to you. Someone replies, oh, I don't have time. They don't reply at all. You know, someone doesn't answer your email or DM or, you know, that's it. That's the worst that can happen. And it's not that bad. Sometimes I find it's helpful to think, what's the worst thing that's going to happen here? Uh, you have to sort of make peace with this perpetual discomfort. Again, no one likes it. No one likes putting themselves out there. You got to do it anyway. That's just part of, like I said, you got to make shit happen. You got to put yourself out there. Um, you know, things aren't just going to, people are not going to be knocking at the door. You got to, you got to go knock on some doors, kick them down, see what happens. Uh, you are free. Uh, I don't mean you're free to do whatever. That's also cheesy. No, I mean, in you are. But no, what I mean is your huge competitive advantage is you're free. You can work for free. So that's another way to say intern, intern, intern. I'm a huge fan of internships. I think having an internship on your resume is far more important than what your major is or what your GPA is. You can work for free. Uh, you know, even if there's no college credit. I mean, I did internships after graduation. Even there's no money. Uh, this is pretty controversial. Uh, I think a lot of people say, oh, you should pay interns. I would say it's nice, but that's not why you're there. Um, I don't look at it as an unpaid job. I look at it as free tuition. And if I'm looking, if I'm hiring somebody, which I don't, by the way, but if I'm hiring people, there's two resumes. I'm always going to look at the people who's basically working for free and wants it so bad and is so curious and is so passionate about it. They have a couple of internships versus the person that, you know, has a great GPA or daddy connections. So, um, you know, you like my overall point is you want to put yourself in the environment doing the kind of thing you want to do. Uh, so just call the owner of places, especially small places. You know, a lot of smaller places, ad firms or design firms, they don't have like a codified internship program. You just call up the owner and be like, hey, I want an intern. And, you know, do it where like, you know, it's not, they don't have to babysit you. It's, you know, six hours a week. It's not that much time, four hours a week. Um, you know, um, I'll do whatever you want. And think about maybe it's off season of when other people intern because internships are harder to get obviously in the summer do it in the fall or the spring um again you know you're, you're gonna hear no's you know but someone's gonna say yes because it's free you're working for free so anyway uh, i feel like this is internships is a secret weapon people don't talk about it enough 
Um, again, if you're in an environment and you can prove yourself that you have a great attitude, you're, you know, you're enthusiastic, um, you know, I think it goes a long way. Um, yeah, it sucks for a little while. You may have to wait tables at night. You may have to, you know, whatever, if you're working for free, but it, in the grand scheme of things, three months or six months isn't that long. So, uh, you know, get the most important thing is get yourself in a professional environment where you can sort of prove yourself. And, um, you know, so you're around people doing the kind of thing you want to do. There's simply no substitute for it. So big fan of internships. Like I said, I think a lot of people would be like, oh, they should be paid. Um, I, I think it doesn't matter either way, as far as I'm concerned. And if you do get yourself into a professional environment, whether it's your first job, an entry level job, temping, interning, you know, you put your hand out, shake people's hands, introduce yourself, go to people's offices, especially if they're doing the kind of thing you want to do. Hi, I'm so and so. Um, I want to be a designer too. I want to be a planner too. I want to be a UX designer too. Tell me about your job. You know, like meet people. That's you know, it's a massive opportunity. Um, you know, uh, and also, uh, you know act really interested to whatever they have to say. Even if you're not, you pretend like you're interested. Um, pick their brain. These people are your greatest resource, the people around you. It drives me nuts at Martin when I would see interns come in and they would just sit there on their phones. I used to sit away from a couple of tables, a bunch of interns. They wouldn't talk to anybody. They're just sitting on their phones all day. I'm like, everyone here is super nice. Go talk to them. I'd be happy to get coffee with you. Talk to people, you know, learn. People, I think 99% of the time would be happy to help people coming out of school or interns or students. I think people are, are generally pretty generous with their time because they know at one point a day with those people. So, you know, take advantage of where you are, make a contact and say something like, hey, can I reach out to you in the future for a reference? Can I reach out to you in the future to show you some work? Can I reach out to you in the future, get a coffee and pick your brain? Um, you know, I th this is just how you network. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but you got to do it. And also put your hand up. If you're in a place, volunteer poke your head and see people working like, hey, you guys need help with anything? Need any coffee? Need, need me to get anything? Want, want me to work on something? I, I do designs too. I write too. Like, you know, sometimes they won't take it, but raise your hand. Be like, yep. Because at the end of the day, being enthusiastic, having a good attitude that you're willing to pitch in and help out uh, and being cool to work with. And I mean, those are two big things. I guarantee if you can prove those things in your 20s, you'll never get fired. Be enthusiastic to help out, lend a hand to people and be generally pretty cool uh, pretty drama free uh, to work with. Um, I feel like enthusiasm and a good attitude beat a good GPA or a good resume every time for me. Um, you know, I, I heard there's a great quote I heard about audiences. It's like a creative department is divided into two groups of people people that cause problems and people solve that, people that solve problems. You want to be a person that solves problems for your supervisor. So, you know, put your hand up, volunteer, and, and meet people. Um, you're curious. So let's say I'm interviewing you. This is gonna sound harsh. For some reason, they don't let recruits in front of me at Martin Agency, I'm not sure why. But uh, anyway, if you're interviewing me, here's the reality. I don't really care what club you're into. I don't really care what your GP is. I don't care what you did in your summer job or whatever. I care what you want to know. I care what you're curious about. Because even no matter how smart you are, no matter how much you know, you're still the dumbest person in that building. So I think it's, it's just a shift in your brain demonstrate how curious you are about what that person does or what that company does. Curiosity is your secret weapon. Wherever you are, demonstrate you want to learn as much as possible from those people that you're under. Um, those are the people that get hired. Oh, that person really wants to learn a lot. They don't think they know a lot. They want to learn a lot. There's a great book about advertising. It's very short uh, by a, a writer named Paul Oster. It's not how good you are. It's how good you want to be. You want to demonstrate how good you want to be, not how good you are. So curiosity is, is the main weapon there. So, you know, it, it's, it's, you want to give this impression of humility and like, I, I want to learn more. There's a lot I don't know. So I think that that's something that you should always give off in interviews and when you're engaging with people. You have a really interesting job. I really want to learn about more about what you do. Um, I mean, here's a secret. Uh, here's a, like all advertising people want to talk. <laughs> they, they like to hear themselves talk. So use that to your advantage. Ask them about their jobs. Ask them about their clients. Ask them about their agencies. Um, you know, it'll help you. Uh, that's another way to say, if you want to be interesting, be interested, be the, uh, you know, demonstrate that you're interested, not just in advertising, not just that person's jobs, but many things. Uh, curiosity applies to life, not just jobs. Be curious about all kinds of stuff. If you're not into weird writing, weird art, weird TikToks, weird films, you're maybe not a creative person. You should be putting yourself out there 
and getting as many weird, unexpected influence as possible. Um, anyway, so generally you want to kind of cultivate this ongoing sense of curiosity about the business, particularly about whatever silo you're in. Um, okay, cool. Uh, you're not your job. That is to say you're not your first job. So don't stress if your first job isn't great. Don't stress if you're not doing exactly what you want or it's not the right place or even the right industry. Um, I, I believe that as creative people, you should be mercenaries. You should be cold-blooded mercenaries. Every job you take should have an eye on the next job, right? Every time, every time you take a job, you should always think about the job leapfrogged beyond that job. So you think to yourself, what can I get out of this job right here that's going to help me get closer to where I want to go? That may be just contacts. That might be skills, software experience, category experience, pro bono, portfolio pieces, whatever all in the name of getting me closer to what I want to go. So what that really does is put less pressure on your first job. Because most of the time, my first couple of jobs sucked. Like your first couple of jobs aren't going to be that great. You know, but you're like, just know that it is a long process. And it's just one mile on this mile, mic, uh, on this mile marker of your marathon. Chances are you're only be at your job for one or two years anyway. And don't ever feel bad about leaving a job. If you were expensive, uh, they'd fire you in a heartbeat and if, if you weren't so uh, cheap to pay. So that's, the, you know, I know that sounds cynical. Maybe I'm wrong and you'll get a great mentor who's going to look out for you. And, and I've had a few and that's wonderful. But the bottom line is no one's going to look out for your career, but you. So, you know, have that mercenary mentality. Of, what can I get out of this place that's going to help get me closer to where I want to go? Because um, at the end of the day, you'll outlast your first job and your second job. Don't stress about where it is. It's not a huge deal. It's just one day, it's just one line on LinkedIn. That's it. So um, you always want to think about, there's a great quote, um, Sally Hogshead. She was a writer at Martin a long time ago. She's like a job uh, inspirational speaker now, but from her book called Radical Careering, which I recommend, Radical Careering, she says, you eventually wind up where you need to be. And you have this mentality of like, what can I get out of this place? You're going to wind up where you need to be. So just, oh, so what I'm saying is don't stress about your first job. Just think, what can I get out of this place that's gonna help me closer to where I wanna go? You are not your work. Um, so this is a big one. I'm sure you all can relate. As creative people, we are an insecure, needy bunch. Uh, we measure ourselves uh, by other people's very subjective reaction to our work. Welcome to the rest of your life. As a creative person, you're constantly putting work on a table, putting work on a wall, putting work on a deck and asking people what they think. Guess what y'all? A lot of times they're not gonna like it. <laughs> so this is what it means to be a creative. So I think it's helpful to know to separate yourself from your work. You are not your work. You are not your ideas. You have to put up a wall between your self-esteem, your self-worth and versus what you're, put, what you're showing people. You know, I'm sure you guys, have, if you've done creative stuff, you've already felt this. Where like when someone doesn't like something, they don't think it works or it's not that great. You're really hurt. It really hurts. It sucks. You just have to put up that wall and be like, I'm not my work. My work just represents where I am right now in this long, long marathon of my career. And guess what? You're only at mile one, if you're even at mile one. You know, so you don't measure your self worth to where you are in the race. You're not your work or your ideas. It's just where you are right then. So as creative people, we're always looking for outward validation of others. Like I said, we're needy, we're insecure. Whether it's your boss or creative directors, award show judges, teachers, your partners, this never ends. So don't let that be the only way you define success, the very often arbitrary opinion of others. Um, Mike Hughes was a famous creative director at Martin A&C for a long time, um, our CCO and I had a pleasure working with him for a couple of years, but he was big on you have to find joy in the work itself. You have to find joy in the journey, in the in the climb. You can't always, you know, only find validation in the end result because it'll drive you nuts. Because you can't control the end result. All you can do is control how you react to the work. You have to enjoy it, and it is fun. Being a creative person is fun. We get paid to sit around and come up with ideas. Like that's so rare. So you know, being a creative person. Uh, is fun even when the end result can be frustrating because it will be. You, you don't want to, you know, have your self worth being held hostage by the subjective and arbitrary opinions of others. I keep seeing this uh, Q and A. I can't click on it, so I'm not ignoring you. I just I'll get to it later. I worry if I click on it, everything's going to shut down. So I don't want to do that. 
Uh, you are not everyone else. As creative people, you're always going, it's easy to compare yourself to other people. This is natural to be a creative person. You're always comparing yourself to your classmates, other people you work with, other writers or other designers, people in your field. This is natural and very common. Uh, it's we creative people have this natural instinct for competition. This is probably why they have award shows uh, to feed off this insecurity. Again, we're a very needy, insecure bunch. So I want to remind you, you are not other people. You're not your work, and you're not other people. That saying, there's a saying, comparison is the death of joy. And I believe that if you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, you're always going to be miserable. There's always going to be someone who has a better job. There's always going to be someone who has a better title. Uh, who got awards for me i'm like around super bowl i see who got a super bowl spot you know i'm like oh man or that person got a, a promotion like this never ends i'm on linkedin a lot and, and it's hard not to fall into this trap it's not healthy nothing good ever comes of it but you always it's natural to compare yourself to other people um so what i would submit is you should compare yourself to yourself um you know focus on your own journey a at the end of the day you want to measure yourself against where you were a year ago a week ago a semester ago that that's true comparison and growth and evolving if you're always comparing yourself to others you're never going to be happy because there's always going to be someone out there better um, you don't want to get caught up in that horse race um who has what title who got what award who got what job um i think you'll be a more well-adjusted happier creative for it um it's easy to say hard to do I i'm guilty of always comparing myself to others but i, I hope it's something you, you take from this lecture uh, focus on yourself focus on your own race everyone has their own journey Everyone has their own struggles. Focus on yourself. Uh, yeah. Because you are inadequate. So this is the creative condition. Uh, you have that little voice in your head that's going to say, I'm not good enough. I suck at this. Uh, I don't belong here. I'm a fraud. I don't belong here. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. That voice is always in there. That's part of being a creative person. It's not just you. It's everybody. We all have it. No one talks about it, but it's there, that little voice. It's messed up, we're insecure, we feel inadequate. That's the creative condition. So actually I submit you should be worried if you don't have that voice. If you don't have that little voice of doubt that says I'm not good enough. Uh, there are people like that, they're called douchebags. So I'd be more worried if you don't have that voice. Um, there's a great book, um, pretty famous book by an author, Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. And he talks about the resistance. And it's just always this battle for creative people and themselves. What happens is you self-sabotage yourself. You don't want to confront that little voice of inadequacy. So you say, oh, I'm not going to apply for that job. They don't want me. I'm not going to apply for that internship. So I'm not going to send that person that LinkedIn. You're going to self-sabotage yourself already. Don't do it. That voice is trying to sabotage you. Don't let it. You can do it. You'd be, you'd be surprised how many people you would get calls back, replies back for things you think you're not good enough for. You'd be surprised. Don't let that little voice win. In some ways, I think it's healthy to know this voice is always going to be there. I've been doing this 25 years, 24 years, and that voice is still there. And, you know, what you say is you say, okay, voice, I hear you. I hear you, voice. You sit over there. I'm doing this shit anyway. I'm doing this shit anyway. I, I think it's help, helpful to know that there's always going to be that battle within yourself. It's completely normal. You just tell it to sit over there and don't let it control you. I, th I think this is super important and no one talks about it. It's a very Buddhist Zen way to think about it. So you're not alone. Like everyone has this voice. Uh, this feeling of insecurity that, no, I, I can't do that. Um, they're not going to let me do that. I shouldn't apply for that. Everyone has that voice. Uh, I remember being very intimidated when I went to ad school first or my first job and my second job, my first day at set, my first day on a radio record, my first day in front of hotshot creative directors, my first day at Martin. It never ends. This feeling of like, oh, I don't belong here. They're going to figure me out. Uh, I think this should make you more fearless, more confident, knowing that you're not the only one in that room that has that voice. Everyone has that voice. No one's talking about it. This is part of being creative. Everyone deep down, no matter how successful somebody looks, we all have that same feeling. So that's to say, you know, be fearless. Everyone in that room is as full of shit as you are. I remember thinking, I'm like, everyone in this room is as full of shit as I am, which means everyone's as smart as I am. Everyone's as dumb as I am. You know, everyone's as stupid. Everyone's as inspired. Everyone is brilliant sometimes. Everyone says dumb things sometimes. So don't be intimidated by any situation, by any workplace, or by anyone. Be humble, be curious, be willing to learn, but be fearless. Hopefully that's what you'll take away today. Um, as a writer, as a creative person, as a designer, as an artist, you have nothing to lose. You have everything to gain. No one's going to look out for your career or your inner creative self-worth but you. So protect it fearlessly. There's a great quote by Steve Jobs. Um, 
and, and I, I, this is one of my favorite quotes. I don't like Steve Jobs, but I love this quote. Everything around you that was ever made was made up of people that were no smarter than you. Everything around you that was ever made was made up by people that were no smarter than you. So anytime you walk into an agency or design, no one in this place, everything that was made here, someone was just like you. They're no smarter than you. They just worked hard and they got more experience. So um, be fearless. Although I'm pretty certain people at Apple are smarter than me. Whoever made the computer, Steve Wozniak, I'm pretty sure they're smarter than me, but I love that quote. I love the spirit of it. Last slide, and then I'll do some questions. Uh, so keep going, don't give up. Why? Because uh, we need you. We need different voices. We need new point of views. We need new perspectives. The creative industry as a whole, advertising, media, marketing, it's very homogenous. We're all cut from the same cloth, uh, socioeconomically, you know, like, so what happens is work starts to feel and look and sound alike. Yes, we're getting better, but we have a long ways to go. So we need you. We need you. We need different voices, new voices, new points of view, people of different color, gender expressions, sexual orientations, different socioeconomic backgrounds, nationalities, English as a, a second language, different belief systems, different lived experiences. We need all of it. We need your voice in advertising. We need your voice in media. We need your voice in marketing. Uh, we need your influences and what you're passionate about. So know this, know not only are you wanted, not only are you welcome, you are needed. So don't forget that. We need you creative people. Don't take a bank, don't take a job at a fucking bank or something. We need you. So don't give up. And I think that's my thing. I talk fast. All right. That was great. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I okay. Hear you. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. We have some questions. Can you see them now? I could see them now. Okay. Cool. I can see them. I just didn't want to click on them before because I would have uh, yeah. closed. Yeah. I would have closed my little Do you button. just want to take them over? You don't need me to read them to you, do you? I'll read them. You're, you're smart enough to read. I'll try. Okay. Um, <laughs> this question from Zobia. How are you able to get particular celebrities in your ads? Um, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times we, we have like a dream celebrity. We're like, oh, this is the dream person we want. And we have very good talent uh, negotiators at Martin and they reach out to agents and they negotiate it. And uh, a lot of times it doesn't work out, you know, but sometimes I'm shocked about the people we get. Like when we got, I think Nick Offerman and Megan Mullally were our first choice for that role and we got them. So I was shocked. Sometimes we don't always get what we want, um, but you know, some concepts are built around celebrities. So, you know, like the, the Kambi Matumbo, that spot wouldn't work with anyone else. So that just means you're not doing that spot. Um, I believe with DJ Khaled, we, we, we actually, that spot was originally for like inspirational quotes. I, uh, originally it was supposed to be like Patrick Stewart or like an Ian McKellen, but then they, you talk to agents and agents offer people up and said, DJ Khaled, I'm like, he's much better. So let's do him. So uh, some, you, sometimes you have to be flexible with your concept, your creative to, um, you know, change your idea to fit the person because the person's generally bigger than your idea. Um, how are you able, same uh, person, how are you able to navigate the college environment to get your first advertising job? I was like you guys, I was at JMU. I went to some dorky ad clubs and, and uh, I listened to speakers. And one day they had to like visit the Martin agency and I went and I said, this is what I'm going to do. And it took me 15 years to get in there, but I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. So it goes to my point of like, put yourself out there, do clubs. Uh, Richmond has a great ad club. Um, I know a lot of VCU people um, volunteer. We, we hired a writer, great guy, Kevin. Um, he was a VCU student, a writer, and he was very active in the local ad scene. And, you know, you just put yourself out there and you see, oh, this person's hungry. You have a good attitude. That's what you got to do. You can't, you can't just send a resume online. You got to put yourself out there, meet people. And when someone sees you in person you, and, and you're helping, you know, do ad club meetings and stuff, you know, they say, this person has a great attitude. Um, they're humble, they want to learn more, he or she would be a great addition, let's give them a shot. So you just got to put yourself out there. What if you can't fake enthusiasm anymore? Uh, that's a good one. And you got to fake it. Like I said, fake it till you make it. I mean, you know. Um, Uh-oh. Can y'all still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, you're cool. good. All right. Um, so yeah, so just fake it. I don't know. Um, if, if you have to fake enthusiasm for something, it's probably not the right career path for you. You should generally be passionate about something. And if you have to fake enthusiasm for something, maybe think about a different path. You shouldn't have to fake it. Great job, Ken. Thanks, Christine. Um, uh, what's the best way to network in a pandemic? That's great. Um, great question. 
um, you know, uh, I would say just reach out. I mean, you got LinkedIn. I never had LinkedIn. Um, like reach out to people like, hey, I'm really interested about being a UX designer. I'm really interested about social marketing. You know, find people and say, hey, would you like to meet? I'm a big believer in the power of the inf informational interview. The informational interview means like, I just want to learn more about what you do. It takes 10 minutes. Um, there's no, pr if, if you say like, oh, I'm looking for a job or I want to get an internship or I'm looking for a job, that puts pressure on that person. But if you're just like, I want to learn more about what you do, 10 minutes, it's a low pressure. Just do it. Just keep reaching out. Even if you send 10 uh, LinkedIn notices, you get two back. That's still pretty good. You do that once a month. You've got a lot of contacts. Keep at it. What are your thoughts on the constantly working, always productive mindset? Thank you, Nadira. I love that question. Uh, I, I am very against the glorifying of overwork, working 60, 70 hours a week, uh, you know, especially in your twenties, uh, you know, there's a, this is infected agencies. Um, I hear stories, a lot of people expected to work nights and weekends constantly. Look, our business advertising, you're going to work nights. You're going to work weekends. I'm willing to do it. What I get furious about is when that willingness is taken advantage of. So that's hard for a young person because as an older person, it's easy for me to say, no, I'm not going to do it because I've been doing it a while. It's hard, but I, you know, I think burnout and is, is a real problem for creatives. And um, you know, it, it, I think that goes back to my, like, it's okay if a place, uh, a place where you work doesn't work out. If you find yourself, this place is making me hate the business. This place is making me hate being a creative person. Go on to your next place. It ain't worth it. And I don't care what the name is on the door. Uh, you know, a lot of people will look back. I mean, I have friends who look back in their 20s and all their 20s was, was working in advertising. That's sad. You should be able to travel. You should be able to hang out with your friends and meet people. There has to be a healthy balance. And sadly, um, especially with contract work, uh, that is, that is um, taking advantage of creative people. So, but the good news is you can leave. You know, peace out. You know, you're cheap. You know, you don't have a mortgage and kids like me. So too bad. Uh, how long does it take to generally completely write a rough a 30 seconds ad? That's a great question. I would say it's crazy. Like sometimes a 30 ad will, 30 second ad will take me a long time because I just don't get it. Uh, and sometimes it takes five minutes. I'm like, oh, that's really good. You know, so being a creative person, sometimes it's hard. Like the output doesn't necessarily track with the time of the input you put into it. Sometimes things, if you're inspired and it's a good idea, it's really quick. If it's like pulling teeth, and you're like, oh, it's like torture to figure this thing out to connect the dots. It takes a couple hours, and maybe that's not a good idea. I find my experiences, uh, my best ideas come very quickly, and the ones that are tortured and like pulling teeth, like I said, generally not good ideas. And a lot of times, you probably notice with Geico, what we do is we have a campaign logic, happier than a camel on hump day. Uh, it's what you do if you're a if you're a, a if you're in a horror movie, you make bad decisions. There's an underlying logic, right? Um, there's one, uh, you know, we did recently, I can't believe it, X. Once you figure out that what I call the lattice work, like if you have a strong solid lattice, the, the better the lattice work, the more flower, the more the roses or the ivy will grow in the lattice. If you don't have that strong underlying lattice work, then vines are just growing all over the floor. Um, so I think having an underlying structure or logic uh, to your creative work makes creative easy. I, I believe there's this crazy like Navy SEAL guy who says he has a book called uh, Structure is Freedom. He's like Jocko's and names like a weird fitness guy. Not that I'm into that, but I like that sentiment of structure is for don't be afraid of structure. Structure gives you freedom to be creative. Have an underlying structure that's a repeatable logic makes your life easier. You have a particular process for brainstorming ideas. Um, you know, you usually sit with, as a writer, you sit with your art director and you toss stuff out. I, I generally like to work alone and then meet and, and throw ideas together, then go alone and meet, um, you know, uh, sources of inspiration. You know, I mean, that's that's important because, you know, I feel like a lot of my things I'm into are kind of tired and old. And uh, that's why we need you guys. We need new sources of inspiration. You know, uh, I'm sure. A lot of people look at Geico workers be like a lot of dumb dad jokes and they're not wrong. And so, uh, you know, I think we need new inspiration. I need new inspiration. So I'm always on the lookout for new funny stuff, new funny directors and funny shows and writers and stuff. So I'm always on the, on the lookout for weird, funny stuff. 
Do you feel like being more creative by yourself or with others? Uh, it's both, you know. Um, I think a lot of those TV spots I showed, like when you hire good people and you allow them to plus the idea. Um, for the first spot we showed, which was the mom with the spy mom with the uh, squirrels are in the attic, like our script wasn't that great. Uh, and she walks in, she completely ignores the script and sits down and says, her first line is, she says, um, guess who's not a crossing guard anymore? <laughs> like she's on the phone with her son. Guess who's not a crossing guard anymore? I'm like, that person's hired because that's brilliant. So my point is be open to better things than yourself, to, to that is collaboration. It doesn't have to always come from me. Uh, I love finding ideas and jokes and lines from other people and taking credit for it. Um, but uh, that, that you, you always do want to look for other people that um, can make things better and be open to it and not territorial. Just because I'm a writer, it doesn't mean I don't, I don't want other people to write lines. I, I love it. I, I love, I mean, I, you know, we had a spot with a pretty famous spot with the raccoons and they're eating stuff. And, you know, another writer came up with that idea. And I think we originally wrote it as like vultures and the client says, oh, they should be raccoons. They're like, you're right. That's the client, clients have good ideas. So be open to good ideas. Um, sometimes they're bad ideas. You have to say that, but um, always be open that a good idea from, can come from anywhere. What made you want to work in advertising? I don't know. I just thought it looked kind of fun watching movies and shows. And, you know, I think there was always something that like I liked humor. I, I always, always liked, you know, I came up in advertising when you had like Little Caesars ads, probably all before your time or like ESPN or Fox Sports or so I always loved or FedEx. And there's a lot of brands that used humor. And I was, I love that you could be strategic and sell things, but also make people happy and be in people's living rooms and give them a smile. Um, that always appealed to me. Who are your creative heroes? Um, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of writers that, you know, I was a, I don't want to shock you guys, but I'm, I'm not the cool suave dude you see before you. I was a dork. I was like an ad nerd. Like I would just curl up with award show books and read all the um, credits. So I, I just love writers and there's a lot of great writers I looked up to and, you know, that worked at agencies like Cliff Freeman and Wyden and Fallon and, and Martin. There's a lot of people I admired in Martin and, and uh, so I throw out names, which wouldn't know, them, but uh, you know, it was helpful to look at other work and see credits and see who does the, I think it's helpful advice is like, who is doing work that you want to do, find out about it, find out that agency, find out that design firm, find out that production company, find out that, um, you know, social digital house, um, you know, uh, find out who's doing the kind of work you want to do and learn about them, find out those names and reach out to them. Any other books? Um, I'm sure this has been recommended to you, but, you know, Luke Sullivan's book, um, uh, the uh, Mr. W hey, Mr. Whipple, pretty famous advertising book, a great career book. Um, there's a new book uh, by a guy named Kemeny, Tom Kemeny. It's called, it's just called Junior. There's a blue cover. It's really geared towards writers, but I think any junior creative person will find it helpful. It's really short. It's like 16 bucks on uh, on Apple. I thought that was really helpful. Um, I, there's a book called Breaking In. I believe that's a, a bunch of writers. Um, the, the editor asked a bunch of creative directors, what's the best way to break into the business? It's called Breaking In. Uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll send Scott. Um, I have a little deck full of books. I'll send it on. I think I've done all the questions. And perfect timing. We're uh, we're at the eight o'clock hour, and so uh, I thank you very about, much. Yeah, you know, this is this is really great. Uh, you, you cussed just enough. Just enough. Um, just yeah, just enough. <laughs> so didn't go overboard. So that was good. Thank you for that. Little 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 spice, but nothing too crazy. Yeah. And uh, so thank you very much for this. It was really good. I appreciate it. I appreciate what you do for. All of our students and uh, students everywhere because uh, you, you you are making a difference and you're inspiring people to to uh to go into this fun business and and to do not only into this business but to to do their thing and it's really yeah, yeah. good definitely, and, definitely uh, it. it's, uh, and you do uh, come into our living rooms and make us smile so thanks well i appreciate you guys having me and i'm a big fan of the program and proud to be part of vcu through brand center or whenever you guys have me speak it's awesome yeah sounds good thanks cool. ken thank you all appreciate it Ken Marcus, Martin Agency, senior writer. Everybody's clapping. You all can't right. hear it because they're on mute. I'm going to say that. Cool. All right. Thank you all. <laughs> See you.